Hi, folks. Thanks for joining. We'll be starting in a, in a few minutes. Just waiting for people to join in. All right, we'll start um, as we wait for a few folks uh, to still are still joining. Um, welcome to the R Adoption Series uh, webinar number two. Uh, it's this is a uh, series that is uh, uh, done in with by the R Consortium with collaboration of Fuse, and um we will have some other exciting webinars coming in the near future we'll talk a little bit about uh, that in a little bit um but before that uh i to uh then can you go to the next slide please i'd like to have a few words about the r consortium uh the mission uh the methods and the vision so the r consortium is has a mission to support the r community uh, and the r foundation and help to develop the infrastructure required to ensure the long-term stability and growth of the R ecosystem. And it's we do that uh, by financial support to infrastructure projects and also by working groups uh, to enable industry collaboration. There are several working groups currently uh, in activity, our ladies, uh, our validation hub, and uh, we are also, this can, can be said as a working group to the R adoption series, which is uh, discussions of how we can adopt R in, in, in the communities, particularly in pharma. The vision um, is for an R ecosystem advancing 21st century computational statistics and data science. Next slide, please, then. So the scope um, of the R adoption series is aim at those leading the R adoption initiatives in the community, uh, open to everyone, uh, it's focused on, on how to do things, uh, how to help the community to adopt R in their day-to-day -day practice. And the typical format is a presentation and a focus discussion, which can be a panel, what we're going to have today, or a breakout session, what we have last time when GSK was uh, discussing this. Uh, next uh, bullet. Uh, future topics that we'll be discussing. Uh, for the webinars, the R packages and package development using R and SAS together and defining new standards and there will be many, many more coming. Uh, the plan is to have one of those webinars every two months. Uh, so every other month, uh, we're gonna be having one of these discussions happen. And next slide, please, Ben. Uh, today's presentation uh, is has two parts. It's a... Uh, a a presentation. So we have this introduction, a presentation, uh, which today is going to be uh, our training strategies at Janssen. Uh, we have a quick Q&A for about 10 minutes. Uh, we may be able to squeeze a little break there before the panel. And then the second part is a panel discussion with leaders from Pfizer, GSK, Roche, Janssen, and Merck. Uh, next slide, please, Dan. So great. So we start with the first part, which is the, the presentation. Uh, and it's entitled, Our Training Strategies at Jensen. 
Uh, my name is Paulo Bargo. Maybe I should have started with that. Uh, I am uh, from um, Johnson & Johnson. I was at Jensen, now I just, I just moved to a new role. Uh, but I was uh, developing a lot of these training strategies in Jensen uh, when I was there. I just moved about two months ago. Uh, myself and Daniel and Gayatri uh, will be going over the, the topic of our strategies and what we did to enhance the usage and the knowledge of R in our uh, communities. So next slide, please, Dan. So our agenda, we are going to uh, our mission that we had for this strategy, uh, the training strategy. What are typical challenges that we are facing? Uh, some considerations when we are developing these strategies. Uh, we're gonna go into uh, three specific solutions that we apply, that we use in, in training uh, our, our workforce. Uh, one is based on crowdsourcing. One is a more traditional classroom, but leveraging modern technology. And then some discussion about e-learning approaches. Um, we will talk about practicing reinforcement, uh, support and change management, because training is not only about um, having people to learn. It's not just about SaaS programmers becoming our programmers. It's there's many other things that are encompassing this change of mentality that has to happen. And we'll talk about some key takeaways, and then we go through the Q and A. Um, we will accept questions uh, through the uh, chat. So please send your questions in chat. Uh, we will wait until the end of the presentation to uh, answer them. So Sumesh is gonna be giving us uh, these questions uh, by the end. So feel free to send questions as we, are, um, uh, as we are going through the presentation, anything that goes in your mind and about how we implemented this. And uh, I mean, we, we want to really have a discussion on, on the how-to and, and any questions you may have that is not clear on how we implemented some of these, uh, please feel free to send us uh, this question so that we can answer in the end. Next uh, slide, please, Dan. So we'll start with the mission. Um, and we purposely put this slide, and actually we we're discussing about this, like we, about this being goals. And we, we actually discussed it, thought about it, that this has to be more of a mission. You know, training is a mission. It's not just a goal. It's not just about converting SaaS programmers into R programmers. It's really about a big um, environment that you have to change, a mentality that you have to change. And because of that, it becomes sort of a mission. So our mission, when we started all of this, it was to provide analytical solutions that enable early and effective data-driven decisions to bring novel therapies to the market as quickly and efficiently as possible. So this means that we are bringing R so that we can increase the analytical statistical programming expertise, that we can focus on disease and therapeutic area expertise, that we can enhance the, the capabilities of the people that are working in these areas, that we bring knowledge of the industry trends and regulations into uh, our community using R, uh, that we work with submission planning and deliverables, which is the core of our, of our, our work, but also doing a standardization and implementation that is reproducible. And, and to do that, uh, we have to somewhat change the way uh, everyone is working uh, in this new, new environment. Next question, uh, next slide, please, uh, Dan. So there are many challenges and broadly speaking, we put some of them here because it's there. There, these are some keys that are interesting when you're trying to change the mentality of your community. So, as we're doing training, we always have to keep in mind that there is a need to continue our day-to-day -day job. So it's always difficult to set aside time to do that training. We, people have to do submissions. Uh, a lot of people are still using SAS and will continue to use SAS as as, as, as a programming language. We have other trainings that you have to have in mind that you have to take, you know, take, take time to do it that the, the re regulatory agencies, our companies require us to do. All of these uh, are important to consider as we are doing the, your strategy. Um, there is a wide spectrum of both experience and desire on learning R. So some people have learned R in their college or in a prior job. 
Some people have been doing SaaS programming for decades and no experience in R. Um, there is a lot of changes that are happening and people get saturated with these changes. Um, there is a limit pool of subject matter experts that you can rely on to help on, on this mission. Um, there are skills, um, maybe great, but maybe these folks, they, they don't have teaching skills, which is also necessary as we're trying to implement this, this uh, uh, training strategy. Uh, we also have to think about the infrastructure that you're gonna be using in order to make all of this happen. Um, and very importantly, this is a transformational change. And it's not about skill set change. You have to change your mindset. And there is change in your personal identity. You really need new tools, you need new environment, you need new, new workforce. And all of these are part of how you elaborate your training process. Next slide, please, then. So some considerations as we are thinking about this and as folks should be thinking as we're developing these strategies, uh, one is to think about the audience. I mean, what uh, skills do they need? Uh, are they gonna be doing submissions? Are do they do, 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 explore, do, do exploratory work? Uh, what skills do they have? Um, are they eager to learn? Is this really something that the people are, oh, I, I don't I know, I have to do things in a different way. There's a lot of that change management perspective as we're talking about the strategies. Do you have trainers or subject matter experts that you can rely on? Do they know some are, do they don't? How do we equalize them? Um, do you have people that are experienced trainers? Uh, how are you gonna support them after all the training is done? Because training is not just about going there, do some training and uh, you have to apply it and you have to be doing it over and over and have support. Otherwise they don't take you know, root uh, so that you can actually use it. Uh, you have to think about the environment where you're gonna do this. Uh, I'll be discussing one of my examples about RStudio Cloud, but many folks want to, may want to have a specific training uh, environment where it's more compatible to the future day-to-day -to -day work that you're going to be doing. So all considerations that you have to have in mind as you're defining your strategy for training. Next slide, please, Then. So as I said, we'll be talking about three different approaches that, that we have implemented here uh, in Jensen. Um, there are different times of learning styles. Uh, there are different times of learning needs. Not everyone learn the same way. And because of that, we have implemented this different strategy. Uh, I'll be talking about our crowdsourcing approach. Uh, then Dan is gonna talk about a more traditional classroom with the modern technology approach and also about e-learning uh, as, as an alternative to, to training, uh, training strategy. Next slide, please, Dan. So the first topic is about uh, graphics with R, a crowdsourced training initiative. And it's something that we implemented uh, about two years ago, um, we were able to train a, a great number of people using this crowdsourcing idea. And we actually have done a few other programs to learn other different specific skills over the years, uh, this past two years uh, in different topics uh, to, to, to do, do it in a way that everybody can learn things that are actually applicable on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's really what we are trying to get with this uh, crowdsourcing uh, mentality. Next slide, please, Dan. So first I'm framing a little bit of the problem. Uh, next slide. So uh, there is, an, of course, there is an interest increase. Uh, in, uh, there is an uh, increased interest in using R for drug submission, and that's the, the base framework for all of this training. Um, in this specific problem, the audience was a mix of clinical statistician and statistical programming. We had a large cohort of people that we want to train. It was about 150, 170 people, um, but. Uh, which poses a question, I mean, how do you take time? I and mean, you cannot just take this 170 people and stop all the work that you're doing, that, that you're doing for submissions and, and everything else, and just put them in a classroom for a week and then do the training. So that's why we went with this uh, crowdsourcing uh, framework. It's a very heterogeneous, um, our proficiency cohort. Uh, next slide, uh, or next. Uh, actually, we did a, a quick survey uh, with, the, with the group. 
Uh, we have most a lot of non-clinical and clinical statisticians. And in the non-clinical space where things are more exploratory, there's a lot of folks that are actually our experts or our users. In the clinical spaces, it's in the other way around. It's about, about only a third of the population really knew R, uh, use R. And, and, and so it's very interesting and, and very, how do you create a program that actually cater to all these needs, right? It's, it, it's, it becomes a very interesting challenge. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so some of the challenges, uh, it's difficult to set aside time, as I said, uh, retaining the knowledge is a problem. You know, you don't, we don't want to have 150 people go have a training and then come back and not use this for another two, three months and then uh, they lose and they forget all that they learned. And we actually had to think about using a customized curriculum because we wanted people to use these skills immediately and, and have a capability to do that uh, as, as they are done with the, or they, as they are going through the program, actually. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, a little bit about the, the strategy of crowdsource training. It has four, uh, I'm going to be talking in the framework in these four different buckets. Uh, it's who is the crowd, what is what to crowdsource, how to crowdsource, and what's the incentive to do this. Next slide, please, Dan. So I start with who is the crowd. I mean, yes, you have 150 people, 200 people that you need to train, but the crowd is actually, um, and those are part of the crowd in a way because they are. Uh, it's a very interactive network in the end of how you do this. But the crowd is really the group of SMEs, subject matter experts that you can rely on, which have some art knowledge and but have extensive domain expertise and a desire to teach and learn. And actually from, for our case, we had about 30 individuals that were doing this. Why is that the case? Because these 30 individuals are gonna be working with the larger group of people as mentors and coach. And there is a lot of reverse mentoring as they're doing this. A lot of the people that actually have these skills are younger people that are training older people that are been doing SaaS for a long time. But they're also doing some training for my formal training kind of uh, roles where they are actually creating material that is actually being um, uh, distributed in a more formal you know, uh, uh, webinars and, and videos and, and things like that. Next slide, please, Dan. What, what are we crowdsourcing? So the crowdsource aspects of this is actually the crea creation of the curriculum, the creation of the program. So what we did was we used this crowd, these 30 or so R experts to help us create, what were the assignments? Creating a library of graphics and things that they need or they use on a daily basis, bar plots, Kaplan-Meier, forest plots. What do they need to do? How they do it today with SAS and or other capabilities and how would we do them in, in R so that we can train other folks to do it in R. We start very simple. We are focusing on graphics and using mostly ggplot, it changed very fast as we're doing this. Um, the data actually that we use is mostly simulated data and, an, and anonymized data because we are using, for this program, we are using RStudio Cloud uh, as a platform and it's public. So we didn't want to have our data out there. We're actually crowdsourcing leadership roles. So we are trying to make this mentorship or this network of uh, people connecting with each other through knowledge which is really important part of the crowdsourcing experience. And they're also creating this advanced content, which you call tips and tricks, which is material that they can actually promote and give to other folks through different formats. Next slide, please, Dan. So how do we crowdsource? So we divide this large number of people in groups of about 20 to 30 people. We have six groups. Uh, they were separated by therapeutic areas and which sort of coincide with regions. So we, we actually have a, a group in China, which is independent, not therapeutic area uh, because uh, uh, divided because it was about 20 people and because of collocation, we, it made sense to do that way. We assign experts to every single group, about two, three experts uh, from our 30 uh, experts that we had. And then we uh, use other experts to help with as assistants. And so it, it, it shows a little bit in the roles in here. We have the leads, myself and another two people were leading this initiative. We are not creating all the work, which would be a nightmare for us. To, we have had to stop our jobs to really do this. We have to create all of this. So we are relying on the crowd to create all of this. The crowd is also helping as group leaders as they're helping in this group. And we also have these assistants that are helping throughout asking questions in this mentor, mentor uh, relationship with the, with the people that are learning. We designed uh, the program with repetitions. 
we started with at zero uh, time zero, we give an, ex an assignment, an exercise. We let them work on it for about a week. Um, they regrouped in, in their group, we have 20 to 30 peers group led by the, the experts uh, to see where the staff, so what's going on. Uh, help everybody, bring everybody up to speed if they haven't been able to do anything. And then in the second week, they would come back and present what was done for that assignment. And then we did that several times, changing subjects as, as we went along. Next one, please, um, Then We use uh, several resources, which are important. As I mentioned, we use RS2 Cloud, to, uh, which was really helpful for us because we didn't have to worry so much about people how do I install R? How do I put the packages on all that stuff? It's all taken care by R Studio Cloud. We use a central repository for sharing and communication. We use Teams uh, just because it's available in, in here, but other people, other systems would be uh, helpful too, Slack or other systems that may be available in our community. Um, we created documents, resource documents, and we, you know, videos and things that can help people get up to speed or just get, get a kickstart uh, in some of the concepts, books that were available. We give all that information to, to, the, to the cohort that was being trained. Next one, uh, Dan. Uh, just an, as an example, the first assignment was fairly simple. Do an XY plot of the progesterone uh, receptor versus the estrogen receptor. Um, very simple. We asked people to add color and shape based on tumor grade and, and the menopausal status. And then we did ask them to do a pairwise plot. And that was what they were supposed to do. We didn't, we didn't give them the end result. We said, we didn't say, do this. I want this you to create this graph. We said, this is the problem, figure it out. And so they went, learned, taught themselves how to do it. Had some basic information, some base resources, basic resources for them to do it. Went on and did work on it. And next slide then, and came up with the, this is somewhat of a standard, uh, example of what happened as, as a response, these graphs. So they were able to do it within this span of two weeks with the help with their, their peers. So they would go and talk to their peers. How did you do it? How can I help? I mean, what, what package are you using? Uh, how are you putting the colors and so forth? They either discuss with their peers first, if not with their SMEs, their group leaders. If not, if they can do it, they, then with us, the leaders that, of the program. Next slide, please, Dan. And so we keep going with different assignments and increasing complexity as we went along. We end all the way, as we as we were doing this, we end all the way to R Markdown at some point, and we taught them how to do R Markdown. So we became very advanced, actually very quickly. Um, I'll, I can put this in the chat later. Uh, we actually just published this, it's a Shiny application uh, in shinyapps.io. Uh, uh, we put all the content we use for this training uh, public, so you can go there, take a look, use it, modify it, do whatever you want. Um, it's available for everyone to do something similar to what we did. Um, next slide, please, Dan. So uh, what's the incentive? So there are actually, it's focused on two pieces. One is for the crowd themselves, and the other is for the community, the cohort that is being trained, right? So first of all, as participant of the crowd, you have leadership opportunities that you can that you can now work on. Uh, you can do reverse mentoring, which is really interesting for for getting people to become, especially our high potential uh, employees, to become uh, you know known as experts in in something. Um, they you can further develop your own skills. There is nothing better than teaching other someone else to actually learn something and really stick to it and really know how to do it. For the community, we were able to create these knowledge networks. That people are really talking to each other on how to do things. Um, the, the, content had, the content can be reused. Uh, we actually you know, put videos, record all of these, put all of these in, in shared sites that can actually now be used and reused. Um, there's a right, high retention of the learned skills. Uh, and we did have about two thirds of active participation of people that actually were using this. So of a very small 30% of people that learned that new R, of the people that participate in the end, almost everyone were at least beginners. So this is a sample of a survey that we did on the graph on the, on the side there. Next uh, one then please. And not only that, more importantly, about two thirds of the people that went through the, through the course actually were using this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so that was very, very 
interesting for us, a uh, very interesting metric for us. Next slide, please, Ben. So some learnings. Uh, at first, it's, it's very overwhelming, uh, even for the people. And it's, it's a lot of load, and, and you have to really you know, change the mindset, even how you, you, you learn things. Like, this is not just a classroom that you go there. You actually have to go after the knowledge yourself. Um, because of that, we initially focus on very small steps, and we're really focused on visualization. But we really very quickly morphed into something that become more complex. If even once you are marked down, even once you uh, shine dashboard, shine dashboards shiny in the end of the, the training, um, we we you must have support from upper management because it, again, it's a change of mindset that has to be done. And what we did actually in the end, we 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 put a finals a finals exam for everyone so that we could keep continue this, edu this education that we actually ask people to create some uh, top line reports uh, templates using R Markdown for their day-to-day -day work. And, and that they went on and we keep working for another six months after the training was done on this particular exam. So all of these can help uh, on, on creating this new mentality for training. Next slide, please, Dan. And I think I'm, giving you the floor now, Dan. Thanks, Paula. Uh, so next, I'm going to discuss our experience conducting a more traditional classroom approach. Um, now, when I say traditional, I mean 2020 traditional. And, and that means that we were planning for this to be face to face, but quickly with everything else in 2020, we needed to uh, switch over and pivot from from face to face to virtual, and that really required us to to rethink how we were going to maintain uh, engagement and how we would utilize technology to do that. Uh, now, uh, just a, a few seconds about our audience. So, our audience consisted of about 300 programmers across the globe, and very experienced in programming concepts, but. Uh, almost exclusively SAS, very little, and in most cases, no R whatsoever. And, and another thing to uh, keep in mind with the audience is that they're very focused on timelines. So we're, we're talking about a population that is constantly faced with database locks, submissions, health authority requests. So, so they really don't have a whole lot of time to play. They need to get in, they need to learn the material, they need to apply the material. So our, our challenge um, on a high level was to teach how to use R to program and or QC statistical analyses. But, but really what we're talking about here is a fundamental change in mindset from the thought that I'm a SAS programmer to I'm a programmer and a developer who uses SAS and R uh, and potentially other tools uh, to perform statistical analyses. So how did we piece together this strategy? Uh, well, the first piece of the puzzle was to identify the core concepts that we're gonna focus on. And we pretty quickly narrowed into uh, several um, uh, key skill sets. So we wanted to be able to use R to read in data, to transform data, to summarize data, and then ultimately produce formatted output of the summaries. Once we had those core concepts, then we could turn to R and identify those R packages that number one supported those R, uh, those core concepts, but also just as important to, to identify packages that were likely to be part of the Janssen validated environment ultimately. So once we had the core concepts, we had identified the packages and we had our curriculum, then we needed to recruit a training team. And in that, uh, we wanted to keep in mind not just the R skills, but also folks that, that had training skills as well. And then finally, uh, it was time to develop the training. And there were a few key guiding principles that we wanted to keep in mind when we were developing our training. Uh, one, we wanted to make sure that we gave these people quick wins, that they very quickly see how they could utilize uh, these, these concepts. Uh, we wanted to keep the examples and the scenarios very relatable to their job. And again, uh, especially given that quick pivot to, to virtual, we wanted to make sure that our, our lessons were developed in a way that kept people actively engaged, even if they were in a remote setting. So here I have a, uh, a little bit uh, more of a deeper dive into our planned curriculum. So we started off 
with a general introduction to R and keeping in mind those key concepts, our, our goals for our first set was to understand and use our studio, be able to import data using the Haven package, being able to transform data and provide statistical summaries using the dplyr and tidyr packages, produce basic formatted tables and listings using Huxtable, and also being able to produce basic figures using ggplot. Um, once we, we had given that foundation, then the next step was to add uh, the, a, a training on the internal statistical reporting package, providing the users with a standard approach for producing highly formatted statistical summaries in an efficient manner. And then finally, to build on that foundation and start to uh, add additional tools to the, the R toolbox, so to speak, uh, be that uh, data manipulation tools such as dealing with dates or strings or diving into statistical testing or even building their own functions. Uh, so now that we have the curriculum, as I said, we needed to uh, put in that next piece and develop or find the training team. And so of course, part of that is uh, finding people or developing people uh, with the R skills. But then uh, again, focusing on this, this extra need for training skills given the virtual nature. So we needed people that were gonna be good communicators, we're good time managers, good listeners. We're going to be creative in, in how they put these lessons together and, and also patient. Um, in terms of teaching methods, so a lot of our course was going to, of course, have the traditional chalkboard method of lecture and demonstration. But again, being virtual is important to be able to uh, leverage other types of teaching styles, whether they are team-based or group-based learning approaches, or even game-based approaches uh, to, to filter into the lessons to, to keep people motivated and engaged. Uh, and then finally, um, we needed to make sure that people had the training skills uh, in, in using these, these uh, tools for remote learning, whether that's Zoom or MS Teams or anything else, you need to be able to uh, send people off into breakout rooms and, and manage that if you want to do a, a group learning style. Um, use things such as Poll Everywhere to, to have some interactivity and polls and, and formative assessments. Uh, and then even something as simple as managing participation. Uh, you can't have everyone off of mute talking all over each other, but you, you do want to have that participation. So utilizing something like the chat or the emojis to make sure that, that, that folks are continuing to participate. Uh, and, and just a, a little side note on that, there are a lot of uh, different um, organizations out there, vendors that provide training, not just on R, but on training in R. Um, we, we happen to utilize our studio's instructor training certification program uh, to achieve some of these skills. So once we've identified the curriculum and the people to teach it, then we needed to develop the actual training. And again, in the spirit of actively seeking ways to, to keep people engaged, uh, here we have laid out just a few of the things that, that we did to um, keep our, our lessons moving along. Uh, one is class polls. Uh, so these allowed us to gauge understanding, but also uh, just as importantly, keeping the students active uh, in the lesson and not just watching. Um, then we also utilized guided exercises and there are a number of different approaches to guided exercises. Here I have an example of a fill in the blank. Uh, but the idea here is to allow the students to reinforce their skills, but do it in a very quick, efficient way where you're focusing specifically on the given task at hand uh, rather than a full-blown exercise. Um, we took every opportunity that we had to in the lessons and in the exercises, uh, connect these new skills back to uh, existing R, uh, SAS skills, um, since that was where the uh, great amount of experience was with the students. 
Uh, and then finally, I'll just mention that um, while we used a lot of guided exercises uh, for quick hits, there's still a place for, for doing full exercises. Um, we just tried to be judicious with it. And, and generally we use them more as a, as a wrap up uh, to a lesson. Some other things to consider when it comes to uh, keeping your lessons moving and being efficient, um, the programming environment. So you wanna make sure that you figure out a way to, so that the, the teacher and the students are all on consistent versions of R and R Studio and are using a consistent set of packages. That way you're not spending time in your class debugging. You're going right to uh, dealing with the, the content that you're, you're trying to teach. Um, in, the, in the same manner, you wanna work with familiar data and familiar scenarios where possible. Uh, you don't want to have students spend their energy uh, learning the data or the scenario. You want them to understand it quickly be familiar with it so that they can focus their learning energy on the topic that you're trying to teach and not the data that you're using. And then a couple of things that uh, are a little uh, more obvious, but still important, class size, especially in the virtual world. It's very difficult to manage uh, a, a large group and keep them engaged and, and not have the class get unwieldy. Um, generally, we found that at about 15 to 20 people, it became difficult to keep everybody engaged and keep the class moving. So think about the, the class limit that you want to have. And then also class duration. I mean, no matter how interested the student is and no matter how interesting your, your content is, eventually everybody starts to look at the clock. Uh, so you have to figure out where that limit is. And, and we found that um, most students preferred something in the one to two hour range. Beyond that, um, it started, the interest started to wane and then the activity started to wane a bit. Uh, so some outcomes with our traditional approach. So we, we trained, <coughs> excuse me, approximately about 300 uh, individuals. And uh, if we look over here on the right, uh, we did ask uh, the students to provide their confidence level in performing certain basic tasks in R that we were training on and whether they would be feel they could definitely achieve that task. Probably, possibly, probably not, and definitely not. And in the salmon color, you can see where their results were, where their responses were before the training. And then in the blue, you can see where the results were at the end of the training and saw a definite shift from probably not to definitely not to probably and definitely. So, so we felt really good about the, the end result of uh, our lessons. Um, down here in the lower left, you can see some of the uh, sample comments uh, from, from our trainings and getting feedback. Uh, some general themes were they really like the examples that were related to the job. They appreciated all of the comparisons to SAS, uh, and they really liked when we were interactive uh, and mixed up our, our lectures with, with uh, uh, an opportunity for them to, to try things out uh, in a quick, efficient manner. Um, in terms of some constructive criticism, uh, they did ask uh, for shorter lessons. Uh, usually we heard one to two hours uh, was the ideal. Um, and then the, the constructive criticism was really along the same line. So they, they liked the SAS to R comparisons, but they wanted more. And they liked the, where we use the clinical analysis data in the training, but they would like even more. Uh, so some, some very common themes there. So now I'm gonna, take a few minutes and just touch on e-learning. And the question is, uh, when might you consider e-learning as an approach? So, so there's a couple of uh, things that you wanna consider there. So maybe you don't have the in-house expertise and, and that could be our expertise uh, or it could be expertise in training. Um, or maybe you have both. You have people who are, who are fluent in R and, and really good trainers, uh, but you just can't spare the time or resources to build an internal training course and administer it. Uh, these are all situations where you might consider an e-learning uh, option. Uh, another time where you might consider an e-learning option 
is if you have a small group that you want to train uh, and it's very homogeneous where they're independent learners, uh, then that would also sync up well with, with an e-learning. Uh, and then finally, it's not a, a, uh, an either or. Uh, another option might be to have an in-person or in-house uh, training and supplement that with an e-learning course. Now, if you do go with the e-learning approach, there are some things that you would wanna think about when you're selecting the e-learning course that you're going to have. One is, do you want a pure e-learning approach or do you want a hybrid? There are, there are e-learning courses out there where it is strictly you and your computer. Uh, and then there are others where it's more of a hybrid. It's e-learning, but then uh, the vendor offers open office hours where you can go and seek additional help. Uh, secondly, uh, how does the platform provide learner feedback? And this sort of ties into the first bullet point. If some uh, platforms will, will evaluate the code as you're going through the exercises and provide instant feedback on whether you did them correctly or not, and if, if not, uh, some possible hints. Other platforms will offer up uh, a, a link to solutions uh, and then uh, again, offer open office hours uh, to go discuss uh, uh, additional questions. So, so that's really a, a preference on what you want to use. Uh, again, um, the difference between, do you want a set training timeframe where your students start taking the e-learning uh, at one certain point and end it at another explicit point? Or by e-learning, are you looking for more of an open-ended resource where individuals can go in and just sort of, sort of a just-in-time type approach where they log on, look for the topic that they're interested in in that moment, learn it, and then go apply it. Um, number four, think about how important it is for you and, and the learners to have relevance uh, to your daily job in the examples and the scenarios used. Because um, that's there's a big variety there as well in the e-learning platforms. Some data is extremely generic and there are platforms out there that specifically look uh, and use examples uh, for clinical trial data. Uh, and then finally, and this sort of fits into the first four, uh, are you looking for this e-learning for your entire group or just a small group of subject matter experts? Um, is the group homogeneous or is it heterogeneous? Because that'll uh, um, weigh in on your decision as well. All right, so those are the, the two additional uh, training options that, that we looked at in, in Janssen. Um, now, getting beyond training, you've completed your training and regardless of the method, then you need to use it or lose it, right? So um, here are a few things to think about, a few uh, ways that we offered uh, additional practice uh, reinforcement uh, opportunities at Janssen. So uh, one was capstones. So we did develop uh, for our internal uh, traditional learning, uh, comprehensive assignments meant to sort of uh, give an overview and reinforce all of the topics presented in the training. Uh, we also uh, chose selected teams to um, function on, on pilot studies. So they basically mirrored uh, an actual uh, CSR effort being done in SAS. They programmed the outputs in R and had the opportunity to, to compare what they had done to what the trial did. And then for everybody, we encourage the, the use of R in the QC of tables, listings, figures, and really focusing on uh, those uh, topics that we, we covered in the training and using those in their day-to-day -day jobs. And then of course, if you're gonna ask people to practice, you need to offer support to them uh, and answer the question. So a couple of ways that we did that, uh, we did, offer open office hours. So the trainers and the subject matter experts uh, did uh, make themselves available at pre-specified times that, that people who had questions could log uh, in and ask those questions or log in and listen to the questions other folks had. Um, we also had a 24 seven help desk where uh, folks could go in, post a question, 
the subject matter experts would answer those questions online, the questions and answers would be posted. And so the next person could come in and look to see if they had a question, had that question been asked already and answered? And if so, great. And if not, then uh, they would be able to post their own question. And that way, building up a database of, of questions in the community. Uh, and then finally, we, we had a series of recurring meetings that we called our walks. And this was really split into to two sections. The first section being uh, a pre-specified training topic given by someone in the community, um, uh, usually 15 to 20 minutes, no more than that, a small topic of, of interest. And then the second half of the lesson was just an open forum for people to ask questions and, and discuss any issues that they were uh, coming across. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Gayathri, who was going to talk about how the trainings, the practice, and the reinforcement, all of this fit into the larger change management plan. Thank you, Dan. So it was awesome to hear the ins and outs of our adoption through Dan and Paulo. And you can understand all the challenges are pressure tested with the mitigations that they just presented. So to start off with the presentation, I want to say it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the most adaptable to change, like Darwin coded. Next, next slide, please. So that Paulo already alluded, saying this is a transformational change that we are talking about. So two years before when we started doing this, we evaluated the forces for the change. So what are all the things that we already have available and what are all the challenges we're going to face? Who are all our audience that we're going to um, cater? Who are all the partnership we're going to um, connect? And also what are all the connections with like capitalizing the connections which we already have that we're going to leverage? So we evaluated this whole thing that I just stated, because as you know, this is an open source technology. So there's plethora of knowledge that's available. So we have to evaluate what we can use, how we can use and how that's going to be available for our people. And also there was quite a lot of um, transparency with this whole R and also the other open sources where it was all globalized. People were ready to give out all the code, everything was there, but there is also some level of privatization that we wanted to do so that we can customize it for our people's need. And of course, this was digital convergence. We had so many things going on at the same time. So when all these were changing, how each organization took it into account was very important to evaluate at this point. So here, what we did was like, we socialized with our leadership team. Of course, our leadership team was very confident with what we are doing. They were more proactive than what we are. And they also, uh, encouraged our creative confidence. So which you can see with all the creativity that our people came up with, with our trainings and our uh, rollouts and also the supporting mechanism that was set up. As we were trying to do our uh, training awarenesses, we also did a stakeholder analysis to understand who are all the stakeholders who's going to be affected and who are the ones who we have to uh, provide with like awareness knowledge to understand what we are doing here. And so we did a good impact analysis to understand not just our our training and planning and communications but also how we're going to roll out and how we're going to sustain because sustainability was one of the biggest question here because it's not like as dan said it's it's not like you teach and you leave it because if you don't use it you're going to lose it so we also have to see how we're going to sustain in here so the other than having partnership and also other than having connections, we had like small group trainings, our hypercare support, our SME support, the walks and talks, which Dan just shared, were all part of our planning. Next slide, please. So here comes the big picture. Apart from doing all the monitor planning, all the operations, all the logistics of training 300 people with 80 sessions, you can imagine in a global company, which is in three or four different regions, with all the time zones, how did we even manage? And then came our COVID. So all the plan that we wanted to do in as face-to-face -face turned into virtual. So now we have to go learn Zoom, we have to go and learn surveys, we have to go learn everything even before we go teach. So the challenges were like paramounted in front of us. But since we had a well plan already, we were able to execute in, in short modules. 
So this plan didn't just start from top down or bottom up. It was all over the place, which means it, it was embedded in our GNO. It was the mission, like what Paulo stated already, where each person had this in their GNO. And the leadership was very cooperative for us to implement all this in all blocks. So apart from the business strategy, we also were very realistic. We know this is not going to happen in one calendar year. So we had it as a multi-year initiative rollout, which means we train people in this year, we implement through pilots in next year, and then we see the return of benefits in future years. So we were very pragmatic in applying the principles that we practiced here. So in our second block, you will be able to see how we did it inside our company and also outside the company. As I said, this is a very transparent forum. Yes, so how can we leverage all the knowledge that we are doing? So we had a very good team, which include Paulo, Dan, and also Sumesh, who have always had ear to the ground to understand what's happening outside, to bring things inside through their external engagement connections. With our leadership, who also poured extra knowledge to us, we were able to thrive through our trainings, through our experimenting. Yes, we have a great kinesthetic learners. Yes, we all are programmers, right? We all want to experiment and then we all want to learn from our experience. So it's not like any other software courses you can just teach to them. They want practical experience. So that is what we provided with them. And also we did this as a multi-prong initiative which means there was a training team, there was a pilot team, everybody had divided and conquered it. And it was more like a matrix management. So you can see all the small pieces that goes in here was not done by just one group. It's a village that took to do the training here. And of course, everybody is different in learning. We have visual learners. We have people who have challenges with learning through, you know, um, through just videos. They want they want material to learn. So we leveraged all the other forms and means of learning so that we can categorize and as well as cater our, all of our learning people here. And of course, communication was the key. It's not a checkbox work. You cannot go and say, here we go, we rolled out R, we're all done. It's never going to happen because the change is not going to stick. We have to teach them at least three times for things to stick, but our people was really, really good in, in claiming to the new, new situations and also running along with the change. So for which our communications, the, the thorough communications, and they have to be part of change. They have to own the change, otherwise, change is not going to stick with them. And of course, there will be some resistance management. Why? Because you have to imagine these people have experiences like 20 years or 10 years in SaaS and moving them off of SaaS and introducing a new language to them is going to be challenging because for them, everything is going to be new. So like Paulo said, we gave them an opportunity like 5%, 10% of their time so that it's, it's more fun for them to get involved. And some are like learners, some are like teachers. So we also gave them opportunity to be like mentors, to be like one of the part of the train the trainers. Some were like people who love to organize these meetings. So everybody had a share to contribute in this whole initiatives. And of course, as we are building the ship, we also have to move. So there are other challenges that we had where we had certain studies, which even we're trying to provide um, outputs in R. So we had some regulatory touch points, we had some lesson learns. So everything was in a closed loop. So the communication was very thorough throughout the whole process. So we kept the whole group replenishing with all the knowledge that we came across. Next one, please. Of course, it's not a start to end a happy story. Yes, it was a very winding road. We planned, we had our team assembly, we had our governances so we know what we are doing, what kind of uh, metrics that we are going to calculate, how is our access controls, how is all the systems going to work. Yep, the virtual challenge was really, really hard to manage with the training, but we still thrived that and we came out of it. And rolling out, yes, that was another thing because as you see, the rollout didn't happen like on 30th of September, we're rolling out R. It's a process, it's a journey. And that journey comes with so much changes and all those changes has to stick to the people. As they usually say, well-planned is half done. We got it all well-planned. So that was half of the work was already done and the rest is only implementations and carrying it on to the our world where we're going to increase our engagement and our pilots in future opportunities. Next slide, please. So finally, a few takeaways. 
when it comes to training, it's not one size fit all, like I already said, we have to identify our goals, know our audiences. We also have to have our resources in place exactly. because it cannot be like a boring uh, classroom teaching. It should be very interactive. Second thing, keep your training again, interactive related to job. Otherwise, you know, your people are not going to stick to you. Third, provide your audience with opportunities to reinforce the learning. As soon as they learn, they have to start implementing it. Otherwise, it's so hard to stick. Provide your audience with post-training support. Like Dan said, apart from the e-learning support we had, we also had Red Desk, which means it has a repository of Q&As that was built. And it, 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 it was so interactive. Like anytime you go, you ask a question, it will tell you whether that question was previously answered. If not, uh, there is a support group who's going to answer those questions and it's going to come back to the system. So it's constantly building this knowledge there for us. And again, training is not the only aspect. You saw that in the previous slide or previous, but the, uh, the two slides ago, it's a whole process that has to be planned strategically, tactically, operationally, and implemented all levels, because this is not just an awareness from people's perspective, it is also awareness from sponsor's perspective, which is a leadership team. So everybody needs to know their goals and objectives. And that's how this whole ship runs. With that, I think I'm handing it over to Sumesh or for any questions. Thanks, and thanks, Gatri. Uh, yeah. We don't have a lot of, we're a little bit over time. We have just a few minutes for questions. Uh, Sumesh, if you can give yes, us some of I, the questions. I don't see many questions on the chat. Basically one of the questions Julia raised is uh, the Shiny app training. Uh, she wants that link. Uh, I think uh, we already have that in the presentation. So maybe something, Paolo, if you want to share that link. I just, yeah, I just uh, posted in the chat right now. Um, Perfect. <laughs> so you can do it. So, so yeah. yes, feel free to use it any way you want. Uh, the, the only disclaimer is it's still a working process. We are still developing that app a little bit, uh, not so much for the training. So, perfect. Thanks. And uh, Hona, I think you have a question. Uh, have been wondering what is your experience or thought in terms of predicting which of existing base on our CRAN R packages is highly likely becoming part of the validated environment. I think this is a little bit out of a scope on this question, uh, but if it is more related to the training, it's basically what, what Dan and uh, Paolo has alluded that we use like tidy TL, uh, uh, tidyverse or ggplot. So those are the packages that we feel that will be uh, very useful in the training environment. And also I see Mike has mentioned about uh, using learning R package that will be a great package for developing uh, any kind of training tutorials or sessions actually. Uh, and I have the last question, Magesh, uh, from Magesh, can we get the recorded presentation? So, uh, uh, I think the, the recorded presentations will come, there will be a link in the same uh, site that we have the registration. So links for the webinars will be there. One comment about the validation is we have the first webinar with GSK and, and Nichols presented, uh, which is already posted as far as I know uh, in the website um, with the uh, a lot of information about how GSK is approaching validated yeah. environment. Uh, I think that uh, we have thought about this uh, packages uh, as we're used in environment in the environment validated environment. I think um, the, the difficult on predicting this is that uh, people are going to have different environments, right? So that that's something that you have to really look into uh, uh, the your environment that you're going to be using. And as Dan was showing, we have even our own package that we are going to be training on for for present for uh, submissions, right? For creating some of this uh, this this material, um, so we have to look into it from from that perspective. Just as a, a quick comment on on that, I, I know it's a little off topic, um, but uh, that's actually been discussions just started, I think, this week uh, between Rush Novartis and GSK on uh, creating, validating a common pool of CRAN uh, packages that will be available to all pharma. So that's something that's, you know, it's a conversation that's happening right now, basically. 
Thanks, Karen. Karen, I think that I think that the next webinar is going to be about packages, right? You guys, Rush is is doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. So stay tuned for in two months we have another webinar. <laughs> I'm sure Kieran's going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> Any Great. other questions? If not, Samesh, I think you. Uh, okay, there is one more question coming in the chat. Does Janssen currently have a sort of R only submission in the pipeline? Um, I guess Olivier, there's a question for you, uh, Samesh. I, Olivier. <laughs> I will redirect to Olivier. Olivier is on the call. So, Olivier, do you want to chime in on that? I, I didn't catch the first part was it like do we have a does Janssen currently have a sort of r only submission in the pipeline uh completely study submitting in r in the future pipeline so so that's the the questions i think a lot of the Janssen staff is asking and my answer is always like not near term um because uh, you know, a submission is not made of one study, maybe except in oncology, and it's less and less true. It's made of combination of studies, some of them being done today, some of them being done 10 years ago. So I think for the years to come, there will still be mixed packages or mixed of SAS and R. I think there are also some situation where we might decide to stick to SAS for some specific activities. Um, but Theoretically, I don't think there's anything preventing it. And we're seeing it with the you know, emergence of ADAM packages, TLF packages. There's most likely uh, uh, a way to do it 100% in R if you wanted to. Thanks, so With that, Samesh, I think you should start with the panel. <laughs> yes, I should. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I would request all the panel members to switch on their cameras and, uh, and when I'm kind of uh, reading your bio intro, just raise your hand so people might know that who you are. So let me go with uh, introducing the first member. So a Amy Gillespie is an associate vice president at Mark & Co, uh, where she heads the global statistical programming organization. So Amy has been with Mark for 24 years, and she's previously worked on ICON research as a biostatistician. Uh, she also worked on prudential insurance as a quantitative marketing analyst, and also she was an adjudicate a professor for USNS College, actually. So Hemi has a MS in Applied Statistics from Villanova University and a BS in Quantitative Business Analysis from Penn State. Welcome, Amy, to the panel. Thank you. Let me introduce the next panel member, Olivier Leconte. Uh, after obtaining his uh, MS in MSc in uh, Mathematics applied to Informatic Engineering in 1998, uh, Olivier joined the pharma industry, specialized in software development for SaaS applications for biometrics team for both Sanofi and Servia. In 2016, he moved to Roche UK as a statistical programmer and analysis associate director. Uh, taking on responsibility of uh, statistical programming team in immunology and neuro neuroscience. Uh, during that time, Olivier held uh, several uh, different roles uh, within FUSE organization, including 26 EU Connect Chair and EU Single Day Event Director. In 2012, he joined Novartis Pharma as an executive director, where he built a statistical reporting group to support the general medicines pharmaceutical portfolio. In 2017, he took the lead of data operations development unit team, coordinating all data management, clinical programming, and statistical programming activities for Novartis um, and development, as well as supporting the launch of Novartis clinical data science project. Since uh, July 2018, he is the head of clinical and statistical programming and analysis at uh, Janssen Pharmaceutical Company at j, j Welcome, Olivier, to the panel. Thank you, Samesh. Let me introduce the next panel member. Uh, Mike Smith has worked in a variety of roles at Pfizer over 28 years. He's currently a senior director in statistical uh, statistics, providing specialist compute, computation and modeling solutions to the project, evaluating uh, deploying new tools. He's an R Studio certified Tidyverse trainer, 
and a professional RG. He was previously in the similar role for pharmaco uh, pharmacometrics modeling simulation group within the clinical pharmacology at Pfizer. He has trained almost 500 Pfizer colleagues on Tidyverse. Uh, in, uh, he is uh, the author and collaborator of many manuscripts pertaining to model informed drug development, modeling and simulation and implementation of tools and workflows to assist this. So welcome, Mike, to this panel. Thanks, Amesh. We have the next panelist, Kiran Martin, uh, has been at Roche for six years, working across a variety of uh, molecules and projects as statistical programming. Uh, during that time and before he had been advocate for the benefits of using R. More recently, he has directly taken on the role to influence the future direction of how PD data science at Roche will be using R in the future. Welcome, Kiran, to the panel. Thank you. Last but not least, Michael Rimler is a director of clinical programming and innovation leader in the technical excellence and innovation group. He has 12 years of experience reporting on clinical trials, providing both technical and analytical support to programming team. Prior to joining GSK in 2018, uh, Michael worked on multiple CROs and served as a faculty for Xavier University as an assistant professor of economics. In addition to leading innovation activities within clinical programming, Michael serves as a primary business lead for the integration of R into GSK's clinical reporting process. In this role, he oversees activities driving the use of R for independent QC, developing standard reporting tools in R, and exploring opportunities for using R uh, for the generation of uh, trial results. Externally, Michael is also co-lead of FUSE Working Group on Multilingual Clinical Reporting, sub-team uh, lead for uh, Transcelerate, a modernization of a statistical analysis project and co-chair for 2022 FUSE US Connect. Welcome, Michael, to the panel. So we have a great um, uh, team. So let me start with the question in the interest of time. So we all know that a very interesting topic was presented. So my question is more about, we have a concept of build, buy, or hybrid, both build and buy kind of thing. So what is your approach when creating a robust training strategy? And I also, the second follow of this question is, what is your experience with the challenges uh, or, or the benefits uh, when, when, you, when you go for this kind of approach, either a build, buy, or a hybrid? I'll start with Amy. Okay, great. Thank you, Samesh. Uh, great question. So um, I'll talk a little bit about our strategy that we've um, employed here at Merck, and it's not so different than what we heard um, described uh, by our presenters from Janssen. So we basically pursued a strategy of, of both, um, building and buying. And um, the reason that we went this way is we recognize that a multidimensional training strategy for R um, is, is most valuable because everybody has different learning preferences and, and different needs. And you know, really recognizing that not one size fits all. So we um, uh, pursued an internal training approach um, uh, where um, the training was provided by peers, so peer-to-peer -peer training, and we developed three different levels of training. Um, we also um, supported staff to use Coursera. Um, if there was an interest on more of an on-demand training approach. And um, we um, kind of pointed people to, to take a course that was very similar to our internal level, level one training course um, through Coursera. We're also currently partnering with a Taurus um, to develop um, interactive and on-demand training. Again, tr uh, targeted specifically to our needs and very similar to our level one peer-to-peer -peer training course as well. And then we also made additional resources available to our staff, whether it be you know, different books, webinars. Um, we had SAS to our, to our cheat sheets developed. Um, we heard that in the presentation earlier today, how people wanted to understand how to do things in R that they were more familiar with um, and doing in SAS. So we made kind of a cheat sheet available to our staff. 
And then we also um, have a very thorough uh, web-based um, training pages with a lot of different content where people could go and, and learn and, and seek information and resources as needed. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Amy. Olivier, uh, can you share your experience from Janssen? I, I think Guyfrey, you know, went uh, into that strategy in detail. So I, I would not have had much more. I think on the experience, uh, what we've learned is training is just one part of it. The, the biggest part is the experience. You know, the number of time I use that phrase, I rem you reminded me of, you know, you remember people, uh, uh, you know, when I graduated in 1998, my first SaaS training, I would have been absolutely unable to create an Adam data set. And I think that's the same challenge people are facing. They're going to an R training, but that doesn't mean they can build. So I think what we've learned is don't be afraid to take the training a few times, practice, offer different type of practices, initiative, and then, you know, we're striving, especially next year to uh, get to, you know, the real work and not just QC work or initiatives. Uh, and I think, you know, what we're doing today also for me is very important in terms of learning and sh is sharing with others. Because behind R, R is just a technology. The real challenge is the open source mindset, yeah. which I think we are all adding to. And I think that's what will make the difference. Yeah. Thanks, Olivier. And, and, and basically, the presentation clearly stated that we went with a hybrid mode of both uh, buy and build kind of thing. So same thing like uh, for e-learning, we use data camp and things like that. So pretty much, I think what Amy, you mentioned, we, we are pretty much did the same kind of thing. Right. So uh, 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 Mike, uh, do you want to share your experience? Well, how Pfizer had? Yeah, so, so far we used to buy in training um, from a, a consultancy group. Um, but since I became certified, I've kind of built on what's the, the good work that's been done by our studio education group. So they post all of the master the tidyverse course course training materials, uh, amongst others. You know, many many courses are up there, and so what I've done is to kind of re-deliver that training internally. Um, I think the next step on from what I've done is to then uh, adapt that. So insert more relevant data sets, or you know, tweak what's there to make it more relevant based on. Uh, what colleagues are telling me but actually i think you know starting there with the generic example data sets like the palmer penguins data set or whatever it is or the nt cars data set that gets people through the door mm -hmm. i think what i need to start thinking next is how do i augment that either through learner tutorials or through flipped classroom where i can say you know we have the materials we have the videos of those training sessions review them now let's come back and then look at you know a real life example data set and and trying to apply what you've learned there one of the other things though is it seems to me if you buy training if if there's been a cost involved to an individual or to an organization colleagues are more likely to turn up and pay attention you know so it's it's actually quite tough if it's an internally delivered training for them to kind of switch on and go, oh, yeah, I'm not paying for this, so it doesn't really matter. I'll, I'll just do this email or I'll just do this thing over here. So it, there's that kind of um, importance, I think, that the transaction brings. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to hear how Janssen and Johnson Johnson are, are handling that kind of, no, this needs to be something that you devote your time to. And so you're allowed to take the time in your day, in your day job to actually learn. Okay, that's that's great. Um, uh, Kiran, you want to share your experience from Roche? Yeah, sure. So I I, I think um, we have gone for a hybrid approach, but I think um, uh, we prefer in house, and certainly I prefer in house where possible um, because you get a lot of advantages from that. You can deliver in house training on your schedule a bit more more easily, um, more at point of need. Um, and you also can use your own environment in your own data, which is sort of relating to what Mike was just saying there. Um, and also to what Olivia is saying is that training isn't the only part. So you really want to target people who uh, have a use case, have, have something something they can apply the training you're going to 
going to give to them. Um, that said, you know, we've we've used various um, platforms, um, both in terms of like um, online training and also, um, uh, you know, directly given training as well um, in, in targeted ways um, where it makes sense. Um, I'm definitely sort of leaning towards in-house training where we can do it. But the challenge is always in kind of resource. And uh, I yeah. definitely agree with, with Mike that, that it can be the case that sometimes you, you don't quite get the audience you might have otherwise. Um, sort of trying to, uh, I don't quite have the answer to that one yet. Um, <laughs> I think the main one is just to sort of bang the drum about how, uh, how R is becoming more important. So people are incentivized to go on these trainings. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah, that's greatly uh, that's greatly said because uh, that's what that's what guy three uh, presented in our slide deck. The mindset needs to be changed. Actually, that's been very important. Uh, going to Michael, Michael, your experience with GSK. Yeah, so at GSK, we um, I think we were almost exclusively a build shop. You know, we we did everything in house. Um, from a fundamentals perspective, our statistical data sciences group had a couple of uh, core training modules that were available and instructor led training and 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 delivered that way. From a uh, um, in terms of serving those that are working on GXP type work, uh, we still focused on the user. So very early on in our process, we recognized, uh, as others have mentioned, that the experience matters. Uh, we wanted to make sure that they had an on-the-job on opportunity to use what they were learning coming out of those instructor-led courses. Uh, and then we wanted to, we focused their efforts on supplementing that with um, resources. We built our own internal, um, what we call a guidance document that um, had real use cases. So we, we created a synthetic kind of four atom domain uh, database of like 24 subjects, completely synthetic, but we could read that in and generate some of our templates. We could write scripts, give them example code, kind of template code, um, but give them some place to start with. You know, we looked back at how we learned SAS and said, you know, just like Olivia was saying, you know, we, we, you read a book, you take a course, you take a test, but you can't really do uh, an Atom data set. So, but how I learned and became proficient in SAS was by looking at other people's code and tweaking it to fit. So the inputs got to the outputs that I needed. And we took that approach uh, and we built, uh, I think, a pretty good infrastructure and then offered other opportunities, um, leveraging things like um, uh, this. Recently, we looked at, at the R Book Club that um, modeled after what Maya Gans uh, delivered at the R Studio Global Conference last year. We have an R Coders Corner, kind of a monthly exercise that gets people involved and engaged. It might not be a lot of teaching and learning, but it gets them engaged with and gets them in the door so that they then want to learn and, and other things that we've offered along the way that supplement that instructor-led training for the fundamentals um, and, and gets them to, to, to close that gap so that when they're doing sort of on-the-job type activities, they continue to learn and, and feel like they have the support to, 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 uh, to progress. Yeah, I think that's great, actually. Um, just a quick question, maybe this is, maybe can take 30 seconds to answer, but it may be a lengthy one also. What was your experience on the resistance on the programmers, basically SaaS programmers moving into R, and how did you kind to uh, manage or address that resistance? Uh, Mike, I'll start with you, actually. I'll go random, uh -huh. just <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> um. I guess I haven't seen, um, I, I'm not working directly with the statistical programmers, okay. um, but I think it's, I, I take the point made it earlier that there are often more junior colleagues who learned R in college and learned, you know, tidyverse in college and things like this. It's, it's kind of the old lags, the people that learned base R ages ago and are going, oh, I don't need to learn this stuff, this newfangled way of working i'm perfectly uh, uh you know efficient today using this and you know that's a hard one to overcome there's the kind of flip of well you may be able to do all of this in base r and that's lovely you know but actually the person QCing your work is more familiar with the tidyverse way of doing things so you know if you migrate towards the uh, uh, a harm harmonized way of working then it will make you may struggle to get there but it'll make the QC much quicker, or we mm -hmm. could, you know, have a, a more generic script for doing this. So it's the the resistance is is just sometimes about efficiency. 
you know yeah. i get my job done today really quickly using the tools and the methods i know why should i learn this new thing over here because that's uncomfortable and i need to learn it and i'll be less efficient in the short term that that uh, seems to be the kind of general feedback okay. here um kiran you work closely with the programmers actually so what was your experience on that actually and uh, is there any remediation that you did to overcome that um so it is tricky um i'm aware that there are some people who are sort of quite resistant to it but the funny thing is is that typically those aren't the people who talk to you the, the people who talk to me are the people who want to learn and excited to <laughs> move into picking up art and i would say that's, that's the majority of people at this point you know i think um what has brought people over because there was definitely more resistance initially is some clear use cases so for, for us that was um our shiny was a big sort of wedge in the door because it was a kind of usp it was clearly something that would be very difficult to replicate mm -hmm. in, in sas so it was you know just a, a nice thing saying oh look you can do this and you couldn't do that in sas so that was a good way to sell it to a lot of people um you know i, I think it's harder um you know i, I would argue that that R can solve a lot of problems um, that are, or at least as well as SAS, but those those can be harder to demonstrate than something that is not impossible in SAS, but extremely difficult to do. Um, yeah. So that was, yeah, I would say um, a, a big way for converting. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm still, I think to a certain point that there'll always be like a, a small pocket of, of resistance, so to speak. Yeah. And that group you bring along by again, bringing the work saying, look, more people are working in R, you need to keep up with them. Great. Uh, Olivier, your experience? I, I think three type of resistance. The first is why? Why are we doing it? You know, SAS is fine. Why changing everything? And I've been working in SAS for 25 years. So why changing it? So I think that's the first type of resistance we've heard. The second, I think Mike was spot on, efficiency. I'm very good at what I'm doing and you want me to deliver, you know, top line result 24 hours after database lock, if not less, all CSR outputs in five working days. But now you're asking me to move from my old Porsche to brand new Tesla, but I don't know how to drive it. Um, so I think, yeah, that efficiency is there. And the third resistance, which is the one which always, that's my favorite, or oh, will the FDA accept? What, are, what is the regulatory? Is that validated? And I'm like, have you been to SAS lately? Have you asked them to open the book and show us how they validated the software? I don't think any company has been doing that in the last 20 years. So, so I think that's a free type of resistance. And I think the solution to all of them is uh, being patient, talking to people, work with them, show them it's doable, and then not rush it. Because, yeah, you know, it, if you've been for five, 10, 20 years using the same language, turning into a multi-language programmer is takes time. Yeah, it won't happen overnight and not rushing is, is a best way to put. Michael, your experience with GSK on that? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with uh, Olivier's points more. I think to, to add to that, you know, we've, I think we've taken this approach of trying to support uh, programmers and statisticians from below while providing incentives from above from a leadership team perspective. Um, so a lot of those incentives come through writing business and development objectives towards the adoption and the use of R uh, for delivering projects and delivering work. Um, and the resistance then, which has not yet been identified that, uh, that, that we also have seen is um, timelines, right? So you, you want me to deliver faster, but we still have to actually do the work. I don't have time to do things in R and, and learn this. Um, and, um, and, and the other bit is, well, you know, we're on a phase three study. We don't have a, the, the only thing we have delivered this, you know, this year is going to be a phase three study. And we've got all of this historical SAS code that we can carry forward and copy forward. It's going to be much more efficient. Why do you want me to recode this all in R just to learn R? So what that's done is had us really, well, on one hand, take a pragmatic approach to what it means to accomplish the objective, which really is towards the proliferation of our expertise and capability within within the group. And then secondly, to think of how we write those objectives so that people can be successful in delivering to them while also being able to deliver their projects. Pretty good. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Amy, any ex experience you want to share from Mark? 
Um, our experience, I think, is very similar to what the other panelists have mentioned, um, you know, around the efficiency idea, around the ability to reuse all of this historical SAS code and SAS macro libraries that we spent so many years building. Um, I would say it was not so much active resistance, but more just questioning and trying to understand what the department strategy is. Um, and I think that there was better understanding once we more clearly articulated our strategy around the adoption of R and then showed how we were going to support our staff. So I think, you know, it's been an evolution, but I think with any change, and this is a change, that um, it's natural to start questioning and trying to understand better, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. So. Great. Uh, I, I think I have one more question <laughs> in the interest of time. Uh, basically, we all work with uh, CROs, contractors, and other companies, actually. And some of us work with same CROs, actually. And we also partner them in our development activities. So, so Janssen giving a training, or maybe Pfizer giving a different kind of training, but its objective is kind of generating the reports and things like that. So the common goal is same. But is there a thought for developing some kind of a common curriculum um, and sharing it in, 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 in a way that it can be beneficial for uh, the open source community or the, even the CROs and contractors that we work with. Uh, I'll start with Olivier. That should be our target. And I think that's why we have this forum. Uh, but at the same time, you have all the other layers, you know, that comes in, you know, procurement, contractual, co-employment, all those things. So I would say if, if you know, I'm, I'm really excited by the work we're doing with Roche and GSK on, on, you know, Admiral and other things. If sponsor company can achieve it, then I think we'll be able to drive the CRO part. But I feel until then, we just we already we need the CRO, the, the sponsor companies to achieve it. Yeah. Um, because I think if we don't do it first, then it's going to be very hard to go back to our vendors and say, hey, you know, we agreed to use Admiral or or another package that is out there. It's going to be super difficult. So, so that's part of his long list of things where we need to change the way we've been operating for the last twenty years. Great. So, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, I may sound pessimistic. I am optimistic, but I think there's a there's a predecessor which we need to hit is three or four pharma companies agreeing to use the same packages and producing exactly the same tables of adverse event, and not yeah. the one with I prefer it bold. I prefer it. In, footnote here or footnote there. Yeah, that, that's a great one, uh, Olivier, because once we as a pharma companies align, it's easier to bring others into that uh, path, actually. Michael, uh, any anything that you want to share on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, if I have any reputation in the space, it's my commitment to open source. So if we can share the burden of developing and delivering training, particularly to our uh, our our external partners, I think that that's a, that's a win win for 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 everyone. Um, you know, it is a challenge if you want to start to require certain capabilities. Um, we know that the the intersection of domain clinical domain knowledge and and our capabilities is small but growing. Um, and so to find those those few individuals that are out there uh, is is challenging. So if we can share that burden, I agree with what Olivia is saying again, but um, if we can share that burden, then I mean, I'd be open for it, of course. Great. Uh, Amy, you want to chime in? What's your uh, thought? Sure. On? Yeah. So, um, we are not specifically training our CROs or contractors at this moment. We are focusing on our internal staff currently, um, but I'm supportive of the idea. I mean, I think it's 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 a good idea. Um, we did um, what what we have done with our functional part sourcing partners is we have communicated our vision to be very clear of where we're going in the future, um, and it's in their best interest to start thinking about upskilling their own staff. And some of our preferred partners have already done that. Um, but you know, as far as a, a larger industry wide effort, I, I think it's a really good idea. But right now, we're focusing in on our uh, internal staff. 
Thanks, Amy. Uh, Kiran, you want to chime in? Yeah, sure. So, so we've actually um, taken quite an approach to um, Amy, and um, in that we've sort of communicated to our to our partners that yeah, we're we're, we're going to be using R more, and um, we kind of we, we need we're going to need resources that need to know R. We went as far as sort of putting together um, not really a syllabus, but kind of um, a, a a list of um, skills that we were looking for people to be in. So kind of like this, we, we have this statistical program, a rating of like how we rate our series. We did it with R for various different things, skills that we might expect them to be at certain levels in to help them um, tell us well, what level um, that, that they're at. Um, we've had sort of, uh, we've had some success, but it's, it's challenging because um, uh, they have the same problem uh, that we have in, but it's kind of <laughs> exaggerated in that, um, you know, that they, they deliver training, but then they don't necessarily have a, a project using R to attach uh, a partner to. Um, so I definitely, I, I definitely agree going back to the collaboration point on that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the biggest part will be as Olivia said, sort of coming together because um, uh, obviously at Rush, we have a bunch of in-house packages we're using right now, and I'm aware that everyone else has yeah. their own in-house packages. So if we can try to, to harmonize on that, uh, that would be really great because I think it, it's, it's always going to be a challenge uh, if, if you, yeah, you're using, using two different solutions. Yeah. Um, but to, yeah. so I completely so. agree on that because if you're using Tidyverse, yes, you can harmonize the strategy, but if you are using a customized package, that cannot be common to everyone. So Mike, what is your experience uh, or thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I, I think I'm in agreement with Amy that, you know, it's, we're not, it's not our place to train the CROs, I think, ultimately as the sponsor companies. However, the mechanisms for collaborating and adapting training are already there. So our studios, Master the Tidyverse's courses are supplied as a Creative Commons uh, share alike license. So there is absolutely nothing stopping our in pharma organization or someone like that, taking that training material as a basis, making it more tailored towards pharma, and then sharing that back on GitHub so that then yeah. it's, it's open source. You know, and, and I think if we had something like that, then we could be pointing CROs there and saying, yeah. you know, this core training will suit you and it will be in the right domain. And it's not talking about penguins, but rather it's talking about, you know, clinical data. So, you know, go there, you know, we could augment, augment it with yeah. you know, challenges or example data or, you know, something like this that they could practice on. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, that, that could and, be. And a then, good... but, but then I'm imagining that when those individuals come in and work with sponsor companies, you could say, well, you know, have you got that basic threshold understanding mm -hmm. of the nuts and bolts? Now let's tell us about Janssen's package, GSK's package, whatever's. Yeah, yeah. I think generalized training in a common platform, and then if there is customized, then it can be taken in. Right. So that also kind of avoids any kind of co-employment issues and procurement and things like that. Great. I think we are out of time, so I don't want to further proceed. We have a few interesting questions, but I think uh, uh, we can park that actually. Uh, so uh, it's a great uh, panel discussions and presentation. So Paolo, you want to wind it down? Uh, how does uh, it work? Yes, yes, uh, uh, thank you. I'd like first thank the panel to everyone, all the panelists for coming and sharing your experiences. This is, this is great. Uh, we love to have this collaboration and we are aiming to do that in a more open source way. That's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this for packages, for, for validated work, for training, for everything that we have to do as a community. And, and we really are excited with being able to share our experiences on training and looking forward to hear from you guys in, in your experiences on different areas of this uh, journey that we have on using R and open source in the pharmaceutical area. So thank you very much. Thank you for all the attendees for sticking with us. Uh, and uh, until the next one uh, in a couple of months. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.